Awesome. All right. Well, it is time. Thank you, everyone, for joining today um, to hear about interspeeding cover crops. We have an awesome, awesome lineup um, of farmers that have been doing this and working with it um, that have many years of experience. So uh, what they'll do, they'll do their like 15, 20 minute presentations. Um, if we have time, we'll take a short break and then we'll get into the farmer panel session. So while they're presenting, um, you can enter your questions in the chat box. And then during the farmer panel session, you can unmute yourself to ask a question. So how to use mute and zoom controls. If you hover your cursor over the screen, at the bottom, different controls will come up. Um, the bottom left, that'll allow you to mute and unmute, um, to start or stop your video. And then down kind of in the middle at the bottom is the chat. And if you click that, then the chat box opens up and you can type in your question. All right, so without further ado, um, we'll get started. And we're gonna start with TJ Curtis um, from Saddle Butte A. He works with a lot of different growers and has tried stuff um, on his own too. So TJ, take it away. All right, Jennifer, All right. I will get started here. Can everybody hear me okay? Everybody's nodding their head, that's a good sign. So we'll go from the beginning here. So once again, my name is TJ Cardis. I work for Saddle Butte Ag. I am uh, stationed out of Bloom Prairie, Minnesota. I cover the five Northern states for the company. I cover Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, Dakotas, and some Wisconsin. So I, I get the Northern flavor. And what I've noticed is with the Northern flavor is this interceding is really becoming the hot topic because of cattle grazing, uh, the time frame we have to establish covers. We wanna see more robust covers in the fall. So this has been an excellent way to get started. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a quick blurb on kind of an industry standard of what we're looking at and why we think this can work and maybe some issues that we've had. And then I'm really excited to hear what the farmers have to say because each one of these guys I know really well. I know they do things just a little bit different than what I'm gonna say. Um, so the, the great part is you're gonna get a lot of great flair from a lot of different people and we're gonna have the q and I have to get off the, the screen at 11 o'clock. I got another Zoom meeting for a while and then I'll try to jump back on for Q&A. I told Jennifer, if you have a question at the end of my presentation, it gives my phone number, my email, you can get a hold of me. If not, send them to her. She can email them to me. I can I respond back as quick as I can or I'll try to get back on the call. So that's my, that's my spiel for the day. And once again, I'm at a farm show, sunny Lincoln, Nebraska today. We're uh, the Ag Expo down here. It's re really going well, great turnout. But interceding has been a great conversation here today too. So, um, what is interceding? So it's planting a crop, cover crop earlier in the season. Um, the reason we talk about this is interceding, when you start looking at this, gets confused a lot of times with fall seeding. You know, if you go farther south and east, interceding is when they go into a, just a standing crop. So our interceding is what we're looking at is going at V2 to V4 range in corn is what I look at. I always tell everybody we really need to relabel this as early seeding, pre-harvest seeding and post seeding is what I'd like to see us go to as an industry standard so we know what we're talking about. But our inner seeding we're gonna cover right now is when we put a crop into a V2 to V3, V4 corn range. We're gonna use species that won't hurt your cash crop because in the reality of this whole thing is you still need to raise a cash crop. You still need to be profitable. So we have to make things work together. Uh, we've had some overwintering species, species can be beneficial. I know uh, some of the guys that'll talk, talk about putting cereal rye or possibly winter triticale in with their inner seeding to make it a little more robust in the fall to go in the next spring. We have had our annual ryegrass at times over winter like we like to. I think the earlier we get it in, the more robust we get it, the more snow cover, the multi-species we use, we're getting better chance of establishing it. The, comp the one I sell, and I'm just gonna plug it a little bit, Bounty, we've had fairly good luck with that overwintering. Assist is overwintered, they are fairly winter hardy. Uh, can we terminate it if it overwinters? Yes, we can. And how do we plant these cover crops? You know, that's a big thing is everybody talks about big equipment and we need to make all these special things. Uh, the reality is we can do a lot with what we have. So we don't have to always build these big fancy machines right away. It's something you can do later on, but you don't have to do it right away. And what do we need to know about it? So there are times where we can have some hiccups in it and I'll hit on a few of those. And I think the guys, the, the farmers will talk about it also. So what have we used with success? Well, annual ryegrass has really been a staple of the products that we've made work. When I talk about annual ryegrass, this is not cereal rye. So I'm gonna just take a couple minutes to go over that. Annual rye is a true rye 
true grass. It's more like your lawn grass if you want to simulate it with something. Cereal rye, winter rye, fall rye, depending on how you say it, is a cereal grain. We tried that in the beginning that did not work as well for us. Now you go farther north and then up, in the, up into uh, North Dakota, they're making cereal rye work. Um, I think some of it could be the stature of their corn. I think some of it could be the sunlight that goes through the, the uh, populations they plant, a lot of different things. But we have not made that work as successfully. We made the annual rye work fairly successfully, but we've had some issues with it. The one thing you always want to make sure is you know where you're buying your seed from. Make sure you know that it is a true annual. It's a diploy, not a tetraploy, not Italian, which all those are different species of ryegrass who can that can be a could be a, a detriment to you, not a positive. So you really want to know who are you buying this from, where are they getting it from, and what is the product you're buying. Brassica is at the right rate. We have done programs where we've used high brassica rates. The brassicas in the inner seeding will keep growing a lot of times during the during the year. The annual ryegrass will go dormant for a period. If that brassica gets way big and robust above it, it'll shade out a lot of the ryegrass underneath. We've had trouble with that in the past. We've started to cut those rates down to where like a half a pound of a, a brassica that's 200,000 seed per pound brassica is enough. We've had certain brassicas work better than other ones. Radish planted early, that gets really stringy and straggly, rape seed the same way. Uh, kale, African cabbage, purple top turnips have been really successful for us in the inner seeding from what I've seen. I really like those products. Uh, buckwheat, uh, Matt will talk about buckwheat. I'm really excited about how much buckwheat we're using. I think there's a lot of holistic values in buckwheat also that have run, done a great job for us. Clovers have worked at the right rate. And what I mean by that is if you start throwing out six, eight pounds of clover, if you do get a good clutch, catch of clover, it's gonna smother everything else out. We gotta work with the right rate and the right species of clover. Medium red has really worked well for us at two to three pounds in the mix. We have fairly successful stands with it. We gotta watch herbicides with all these products. And I know the guys will talk more about herbicides later and I'll chime in as we go with it too. But you gotta watch herbicides, but clovers have worked. We tried to use Bersim. It hasn't been as successful as we thought. Up in Canada, they get Bersim work. Medium red has really been kind of a staple for us to work with. We're gonna try using Mihai and a few other ones this year in some trials, see if we can get some more species to work. Uh, looking at other plants, we started to look at Camelina. We started to look at chicory. We started looking at different ones that would probably overwinter and be able to terminate the next year for more soil health benefits. And once again, I put at the top, bottom too, we have tried cereals in, in this mix. I think um, Lance Klissner petitioned us a couple of weeks ago to try some oats in these mixes. I think I'll try doing that, maybe like a 10, 10 to 15 pound rate, maybe a five pound rate, just to throw something else out there, just to try to get some more uh, diversity in the mix. It's gonna be, I hope, neutral to the to the cash crop, you know, um, annual ryegrass is a high mycorrhiza fungi host, so is oats, so all those are have great beneficials for uh, soil health qualities. The other part of the inner seeding is we like to keep that ground cooler. We put that armament over the ground during this during the summertime and we keep the ground cooler. I want to look at some quick pictures so I can show you that we have had success. This is by Bloom Prairie on my uncle's farm. So you look at the left side. That was probably the middle of July, second week of July. And then we got in the middle of August, we had it growing here. You look to the right and that's in the fall right for the combine rain. Now you can see on our stand of corn here, we do not have high population corn. Um, I think some of the failures that we've had with this is when you get in very high dense populated corn. The other part is when you have those varieties from companies that are very, very tall, robust, almost like a silage type variety, but they're in the row crop area. Um, you know, Sygenta has, and I'm not picking on Sygenta, don't, please don't take offense to anything I say here, but I've seen a lot of those be very robust plants above the ear, and they, they do a lot more ground shading where you get like the Monsanto varieties or the Thurston varieties where a little bit shorter statue, not a, quite a leaf above, more upright structure. I don't know if row east and west makes a big difference. I think sometimes it's a stature of the crop growing. I just wanted to show this picture. This is in the fall overwintering, looking great out there. This is the next spring, the exact same field. It overwintered. Now this is a couple of years ago. We had a, a, a good fall. You know, you can see the combine. So if you look at the picture before, you can see the combine and ran, car did ran. You can see here on the end, we beat it up pretty bad. It didn't look like a lot growing, but then the next spring, whoosh, there it all is again. So I always say, you know, it's like your lawn. You can drive your lawn to death and boom, in a couple, three weeks or a month later, it's all back and you got to mow the darn thing again. So ryegrass is the same. 
style idea is you can run it down almost to death and it'll come back up. So once again, this is this is that mix we we're talking about. It was uh, it was uh, ryegrass, kale, turnip, and medium red clover. The red clover is out there. The kale is not there. The turnips are gone, and the ryegrass is there. And we're really happy with this in the spring. Now everybody says, you know, you can't kill ryegrass in the spring. It won't die. It's it's just a weed. Well, I don't know about you, but that's dead. I know that's dead because nothing came back from that. But we followed guidelines for termination. We terminated between nine and three. We made sure our water and our solution was buffered correctly. We made sure the next three days after the termination wasn't gonna get down below 40 degrees at night. So we had to follow a set of rules. We can't make this up as we go. So you gotta follow a set of rules when you're using this interceding and it can work out terrific for you. So I, I like I said, Jennifer's got us on a timetable. So I'm gonna keep moving here. Um, so this is another picture in the fall on Tom Cotter's. This mix was designed more for grazing. He wanted to different graze cattle on this. He had the cabbage in there. There is, you dig down in there, there's ryegrass the next spring. We had a lot of ryegrass out there. He went and grazed it in the spring and put soybeans back on it. So it was really an excellent situation for him. I'll show a little bit of equipment of what guys, I always say farmers are so creative. When you give them a challenge and somebody hasn't built a piece of equipment, Everybody can go behind the shed or out in the woods or resurrect this piece that, you know, dad wanted to throw this away, but I kept it for a little bit. Well, here's some points of this. Tom had two eight row rotary hose. He put them together. He bought that Gandy box several years ago. He put that Gandy box on. Now, I really think when you're first starting out with interseeding, incorporation of the seed is very critical to getting good establishment. Um, Tom was a fully conventional tillage person, no no-till beans or anything jumped into this a little bit faster than I'd like to see people jump in, but he had canning crops in the rotation. He had aggressive cereal rye in the fall growing. He burned it down. He went in with this. He did some light incorporation. He got the seed to take off. I think Matt will talk a little bit about that too. Matt's had some great success with his soil warrior unit the same way. My uncle, on the other hand, I'll show you how we started out here by Blooming Prairie. So we're cheapos. We put this Gandhi or this uh, pendulum spreader in the back of the gator he drove, I pulled the string. I love telling the story. I got to tell it every time I do this. We put 50 pounds in the cedar and went about 100 feet and it was gone. And I'm like, yeah, this is how you sell seed. And he's like, we don't have this calibrator. And I said, ah, come on. Let's keep dumping seed and see what happens. It'd have been a great day for the seed salesman. Not such a great day for the farmer. So we recalibrated. A couple hours, we did about 80 acres, <laughs> put, it, put it back away and said, okay, let's see what happens. Had a great catch. Then we built a machine. But we started here to make sure that we, we liked what we saw. We, we knew we could handle it in the spring, but we liked the species that we tried. So we tried four different mixes. The one we settled on was the bony ryegrass, the kale, the turnips, and the red clover really worked well for us. Then he built this machine. Now, when he finally, you know, it's like everything else, we built this like at, a, at the 11th hour of we should have been seeding like two weeks before this. So this picture is taken in a corn that's really way too big from where we would normally want to interseed at. But the thing that helps him and where he can surface supply, he was a ridge tiller for years. He had a lot of extra uh, residue on the soil. It really worked well for him just to blow it on top without having to do any incorporation. So it really worked terrific. He got a great stand. I showed you the pictures of it and the, the other ones. So it really worked well for him doing it that way, but I would not encourage starting that way if you don't have a lot of residue on top. Because what happens is in the, in the early mornings, you go out there, and around all that residue, there's a lot of moisture. And that helps get the stuff to germinate and take off and it just grows like wildfire then. So what are we doing going forward? So, okay, <laughs> has it always worked for us? I'm gonna be completely boldly honest with you guys. There have been times it's been a total train wreck. It has not always worked perfect by any means. We have had to tweak our species multiple times. We have had to maybe step back and look at how we're doing it. One thing is, as we start moving forwards at that in the third crops in these rotations, we have to start looking at, are you going to want ryegrass if it does get away from you for some reason and keeps coming? Do you want it in your small grains? Do you want it in a specialty crop? So you have to think about all these as you're going forwards. Tom Cotter makes a great statement. This isn't playing checkers, it's playing chess now. We got to kind of keep planning our attack out. Ryegrass is terrific. I love ryegrass. I want everybody using ryegrass down the road, but we have to get you there. And what I mean by that is we have to start you out. It's like when I do my one-on-one -on -one presentations, I said, you guys are here coming to kindergarten. 
I'm not going to take you next week and take you to advanced algebra and say, well, you learned one, two, three last week. You should be able to do this. No problem. No, you're not. There's a lot more work with the inner seating. I don't think I'm trying to talk you out of it. I'm just trying to say we need to do more planning. Chemicals are a big part of this, not just year one, not just year two. You have to look at two years back on herbicides. There's some great studies out of Missouri showing the second year after corn and beans, how it can affect your, your cover crop stand because of some of these herbicides and how long they carry on. If you're going to graze, make sure you read the labels. There is a lot of restrictions on some of these herbicides if you're going to go to grazing. Don't don't mess up a herd by doing this and grazing something that you shouldn't have grazed. Get something in some meat, get something in the tank. If you're a dairyman and you're gonna do this, you know, great idea, but just make sure you don't get something in your tank, get your tank hot because the creameries really get mad when they're dumping milk. You're not gonna be happy either. So you really gotta look at chemicals and then the establishment of it. The chemicals can really ding. Uh, Penn State has a terrific website. Most people know about it. You can find it, ask us what it is. It's improved cover crops. Uh, improved cover crops in corn. It, it's a great, and because it breaks the products down by trade name and by brand. And that way you can go through and it shows different levels of what it could take out on the grasses, the brassicas, and the legumes. Know where your seed is coming from. I, I can't harp on this more. I know I'm an industry person, so it sounds like I'm just trying to sell you something, but really know your seed suppliers. If it's a, if it's a brokerage firm, make sure you know where they're purchasing it from, because Sometimes in this industry, there's always guys trying to slip something past the goalie once in a while. And those are the things that can hurt us in the end. And we don't want this to be a negative. We want it to be a super positive. It's an outstanding way to get covers established in the North. Um, talk to growers that are doing it. We've got a great panel here today of, of guys doing it. There's other ones out there that have, are doing it. And once again, they'll tell you, they've had some failures. A couple years ago, we had, I had a, had a you know, interseeding done and it really looked like as a failure in the fall and the spring guys were calling me saying, this really isn't working, this really isn't working, um, this isn't, you know, it's not growing and it was a late year. I always tell everybody, look at your grass, your lawn grass. If that's not actively growing well, your ryegrass in the field won't be actively growing well. So there's a marker for you. Two weeks after the phone calls came in, the stuff broke dormancy and took off and exploded and it was beautiful. Patience is a virtue, guys, and sometimes you have to really be more patient with it and let it come out of dormancy. Cereal rye, I'm down here in Nebraska, like it says, 52, 52 degrees the last two days. Cereal rye would be broke dormancy and grown like wildfire down here right now. You know, rye grass would still be two, three weeks out of breaking dormancy and growing because their lawns aren't growing. You got to look at those kind of things as the species that you planted. So that goes back to working with your seed supplier. So you know what they're doing, talking to growers that say, hey, you know what, some years you'll be there in the spring saying this is a waste and all of a sudden, bam, there it is. If you interseed some more in the fall, like a cereal, like a triticale or a, or a fall rye or winter rye, be cautious on termination because those can break dormancy at different times. You might spray the cereal rye, the trade off, and the ryegrass is a little bit later variety and not broke dormancy, and boom, there it is. Now you're spraying a second time. So if you're going to add things into it, you really got to watch your herbicides and know when to spray to make sure you kill everything, or know you got to go back and kill the ryegrass. Once ryegrass goes reproductive, it's harder to kill. You have to wait for it to. You, at that point, if it does go reproductive, you burn it off and you hit it with a second pass to kill it. So there's a lot of those parts of the chemicals. And I, I think guys will talk more about this. I, I'm getting short on time, so I got to keep moving here. But uh, please keep trying something. I know it always doesn't look like it's working, but it is. It really is. And I'm not saying that as just a seed provider. I'm not. I'm saying that as a person who really believes that this is a path we need to get on as a nation. We need to keep this ground armored and covered and protected and keep the soil where it belongs, keep the water, clean the water up, keep fertilizer where it belongs. You know, Minnesota, we've gotten some nitrogen rules put at us. You know, we don't want rules to keep getting written. If we can get proactive and show we're doing it, then they leave you alone. If we don't do stuff, guys, they will at some point say, we're going to have to put rules in place. So let's try to, let's try to be a little more proactive and stay on the front side of it. That's what I got. Thank you. Here's my contact, TJ Cardis, my phone number, my, uh, my email address. I will let, I kind of went over on my time, so I'll let somebody else get going here too, because I don't want to 
hog it all. We got a lot of good guys to talk here. So if you have any questions, uh, put them up there. If not, like I said, I got to get off for a little bit, but then I'll try to get back on before the end of the end of the day. Back to you, Jennifer. Awesome. Thank you, TJ. And uh, I'm just going to quick share the, the lineup for what's coming. Um, so next will be Jerry Ackerman. We'll have Scott Hayes, Ed McNamara, and Matt Elford. And so um, we're going to get into Jerry Ackerman's right now. And I'm going to control let's see. Oh, I can't see. Okay. Get it on there. I'll get the slideshow going for you, Jerry. Okay, a little background. My name is Jerry Ackerman, and uh, I and my wife, Nancy, farm here at Lakeville, Minnesota, which is down in the southwest corner of the state. Uh, we farm approximately 1,200 acres, and we have corn, soybeans, and alfalfa, and now this year we're going to start adding small grains. We've been strip tilling and no-tilling for over 20 years. Uh, along with that, uh, we started cover crops probably in 2007 and eight. And about 2012 and 13, we started interseeding. And that's been pretty amazing stuff what's happened. We actually started because I met Ray Archuleta and Ray was uh, helped us that first year. And what was interesting is we actually gained five bushel and maker where we had it interseeded as compared to our normal practices. <clears throat> now, how are you gonna do this? And TJ touched on some things. You can go to the next screen there, Jennifer would. This happens to be, uh, we've got two or three of these rigs, and I will say I don't own one. Um, being with the alfalfa business, and we're also a representative for lacrosse seeds, so we need a lot of these things for our customers, and we've actually got, I believe, about six or eight different rigs around our neighborhood here or in our area that uh, will intercede and side dress. Uh, we've got all kinds of them. We can actually go to another one here, next screen. Uh, this happens to be a Henniker unit. Uh, this happened to be Bruce Brunk from Rushmore, Minnesota. He actually has two of them. He has a Pennsylvania interseeder, and he also has his Henniker unit. And I've worked with Bruce since 2014, and we've been 100% interseeded on our corn since 2014. Now, as you'll see there, that corn is actually a little bit bigger than I would like to see. I'd rather see, like TJ was talking about, uh, B2, V3. I always say when that corn hits four to six inches, get out there and seed because it's such a small window. Uh, you actually only got about 10 days and that corn is already at the V7 stage. So uh, I like to get in there. Now that was actually planted green and you'll notice that uh, there's hardly anything left. Once you get that ground working, that just disappears. Uh, let's go on to the next screen. This here is uh, Jordan Clausen from Mount Lake, Minnesota. And Jordan actually had this older Miller, Miller sprayer that they didn't want to you know, trade in. So he says, what am I going to do with this? He said, I'm thinking about making uh, a high clearance seeder. And I, he said, I know you've got other guys that seed for you. Uh, if I built this, uh, could I get a few acres? And now I said, don't give me any more acres. He said, I got busy. And he wanted to make it something that he could use more often. And I said, well, why don't you do early interseeding? But I want to see that ground stir up a little bit. And you'll notice he actually made little drag sections that uh, are on a chain. So he gets the end, he raises a boom, turns around and, you know, he's got a 24 year old seed. And it really does work. And actually, uh, Bruce Brunk, I did an experiment on 80 acres. I had Bruce drill a part of it, because that's got to be the best, you know, with the drill openers. And I had Jordan do the other half of the field. But later on, you really couldn't tell any difference. And I happened to be talking with Justin Morris, who's the uh, agronomist for Minnesota and Wisconsin for NRCS. And we were having lunch one day and he was talking about it. I said, I really thought the, you know, the drill should be the best. But I've got guys that are just broadcasting on top. I've got all kinds of different machines. And he said, it's not so much the incorporation but he said, just by scratching that dirt, you're bringing up moisture. And he said, that seed will germinate and grab that moisture. So there's, and we've got other kinds of seeders. Probably the smartest guy is a friend of mine named David Christopher. And he bought a 20 foot Marlis drill on a sale for $400. And I said, what are you going to do with that? Well, I'm going to interseed. And Dave tried to squeeze the three disc openers down and he calibrated it and everything. And he went out and tried it. And he said, this isn't working. I said, well, what's the matter? Well, I said, if I wiggle it all, I'm running on a corn row. I said, well, take off one more disc opener. 
So he did, and he thought, well, I got this all calibrated. I'll just leave the hose hanging there. And them two disc openers throwing up dirt, it works beautiful. And he's seen about seven or eight miles an hour. And, uh, you know, he only spent $450, I think, for the drill. So he's probably smarter than that. But... <laughs> and I've got another guy. He just has cattle. And he says, I don't want anything. I don't care if it overwinters. Uh, they got a little electric cedar they put on the front of a four-wheeler. And they decided that worked pretty good. They cut the bottom out of plastic trash barrel to get more capacity. And him and his son go out and he said, we can see the 80 acres in about an hour and a half. So there's all different ways to do this. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, the other thing is, what are you gonna plant? And of course, uh, you're gonna have to use annual rye going into interseeding because cereal rye just doesn't work out too well. It gets too shaded. And again, you wanna watch your corn varieties. We normally want to have upright leaves. We kind of check it out when we're picking out our seed and so forth. If you're gonna go into silage corn or some of these varieties that get 12, 14 foot tall, be careful. It sometimes works. Uh, I say the sooner you get it in, get it established before the canopy is gonna have a lot to do with how it survives in the fall. I know I have a friend of mine who seeded last year. Uh, he had a Henniker box, he had a problem. We got a rain in there and he said, you know, you can just actually see, because I started, everything looked great in the fall. Then we had a breakdown. We got shut down for a day and a half. We got that fixed. Then we seeded some more than it rained. And then we finally finished. And he said, you can just see the progression. Uh, the early seeded did great. The next one, not too bad. The third one was kind of disappointing in the fall. So it's really a timing thing with this energy. <laughs> What's the plan? Uh, typically, I'll plant five pounds of rye, pound of radish, pound of purple top turnip, pound of rape, pound of buckwheat, and a half pound of clover. That's not a very heavy seeding of annual rye, but I do know, and it kind of depends upon what crop you're going into and what kind of residue you have left over, but typically in our area, about 50% of your annual rye is all that will survive over winter. Granted, there may be some difference in varieties. But on the other hand, I'm doing a little different by not spending so much up front. I'm coming back and adding 35 pounds of cereal rye because that's about bulletproof. I mean, you can throw cereal rye out there and spit at it, and it's going to grow. And I want that cereal rye there the next spring so I can plant green into my soybeans. Now, the other thing that hasn't been talked about too much, what about using these cover crops for herbicide? Now, we've been planting green now for several years. We'll go in, plant our corn. Terminate it, you've got about three to four weeks where you're weed free, depending upon how your cover crop survive. There's times now we scout our fields and when that corn hits four to five inches, if there's no weeds out there, we'll see our cover crop simply because once that cover's growing, you have no weeds. <laughs> uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is uh, with that, we're actually going no-till this year. I've got customers telling me that have been strip tilling uh, with the cover crops. Now they've been doing cover crops for several years. They're not seeing any yield drag at all by doing that. And I said, well, typically we'd say you gain eight to 10 bushel by going to strip till. And he said, I will agree. Uh, he said, when I first started, uh, we were strip tilling and we noticed that bump. And he said, I've been on cover crops now, this will be my seventh year. And he said, I don't know what's happening. Either the corn roots are growing deeper, getting more nutrients, or possibly our cover crops are minimizing more nutrients. And he said, we're not seeing it. So this year, I'm going 100% no-till with our covers on that. Uh, why don't we go on to the next screen? And here you'll see it. This was actually a Pennsylvania interseeder. Uh, as you'll see, that corn's getting pretty big already. I need that growth to get that growing and get it coming. And uh, this actually, we can go on to the next screen. This is what it looks like probably in July. Uh, starting to get going pretty good, early July there. And let's go on to one more. This is what I wanna see at harvest time. All our corn has, a, we're actually all variable rate, but our base rate is 34,000 population. Nancy runs our combine, and when she brings that to the end rows, I want to see some green hanging on them snouts. Uh, the other thing that was kind of interesting, and Jennifer, you can attest to this, Jennifer worked for Pheasants Forever for a year or two. 
And I actually told pheasants forever they ought to be paying us farmers because when we get to the end of the field, there's always 20 to 30 pheasants on that last round or so. Once in a while, we even chase out a coyote. He looks mad at us because we're ruining his lunch. But we actually did. They put trail cameras up around two of our fields. We monitored it all summer, and they came with a drone at harvest time. And uh, when we got down that last round, I think we had 28 pheasants on one field at the last round, and the other field, I think it was about 18. Then we went to combine a field with no cover crop. We got to the end, we had one pheasant out there. So it's not only good for wildlife, but think of the guys with cattle. And some of these guys are going to be talking are going to be talking about their cattle. And uh, man, what a lunch basket they got set in there. And with all the cover crops, we found some screw ups. Some good, some bad. I know, you know, we want to make field sure the fields are clean. One year I got anxious and I had the cedar going. I said, let's roll. We went. We got done on 80 acres and Nance says, uh, you didn't spray that with Liberty. Oh, now what do we do? And of course, at that time, I hadn't had as much experience. So I called my rep and he said, well, yeah, let me call the Liberty rep. Yeah, he said, contact killer. You just put it out there yesterday. So we should be able to spray it today. Well, it didn't come. We didn't have hardly any cover crop come. So we wasted 80 acres of seed. My theory was the spray got on a seed and when the seed germinated, it died. Uh, so that's kind of a costly one. But then we also run into these other ones. And I know one year we go to the field days for the different seed companies we buy seed from. And of course they have the ears, us pulled back on the ears. And a lot of these ears were only half filled. We had maybe a third to a half the cup that didn't have kernels on it. And I said to my wife, I said, we need to check our fields. We've got those numbers. We went out there and peeled our husk back, and ours are filled completely to the tip. So I thought, well, what's going on? I talked to my agronomist, and he said, well, I've got a couple of theories. He said, one, you know, you've got that uh, cover crop growing there. It's probably a lot cooler. And two, he said, you know, some of your fields have had cover crops for eight to 10 years. Maybe you're mineralizing more nitrogen. I don't know. So I talked to Jeff Calder at the University of Minnesota because we've done different uh, test plots with Jeff on corn and cover crops. And he said, well, go get a soil thermometer. And so I did. I went and got two soil thermometers. We put one in where our cover crop was growing. And we put one in a, one of my seed dealers, same number of corn. And one day that we checked it, the soil temperature was 96 degrees on that bare ground. At ours, it was 12 degrees cooler. And I didn't think that was a lot. When I talked to Jeff Coulter, he said, holy cow. He said, your corn was still producing sugars and starches because corn shuts down about 82 to 84 degrees. His corn was just starting, just hanging on, trying to survive. So you're finding these things out as we're going. And I guess I'm going to keep going. It's just good for the crop, good for the ground. We actually have a rule. We want to see a living root in that ground 365 days a year or as close to that as we can get. Excuse me. Uh, and anyway, uh, thank you, Jennifer. And I'll kind of keep it short here because I know we've got some other good speakers coming. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jerry. Yeah. And, you know, I go out, you know, to his fields. And when we did that study for uh, looking at wildlife, it's just incredible to see what can grow. Um, you know, what's growing at the end of the year with this interseeding option. Um, it's always been really exciting to go out there and um, also knowing that it's a lot harder to uh, drive a drone than you think it is. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Jerry. And now next up we have Scott Hayes. Okay. Let's see if I can make this work here. Share that. Can everybody see it? Yes. Yeah. All right. Good. Good deal. So, uh, yeah, I'm Scott Hayes. Uh, I guess first I just want to say, holy cow. Uh, so many great points have been made already. So I'm going to have to kind of 
edit what I say here so I don't repeat too much, but some of that is definitely worth repeating. Just, uh, you know, the reasons why we're doing this and some of these little details that Jerry and uh, TJ have already shared. But just a quick bit about my history here. Uh, I moved back to the farm in around 2006. This uh, handsome gentleman here on your screen is uh, my brother Brent, who I farm with. And we went to a cover crop field day once and he won a t-shirt. So later on, I noticed he was wearing it one day. So I, I uh, kindly asked him to stand in the road ditch so I could take a nice photo of him there. <laughs> uh, the other photo there, uh, we don't have cattle on our farm as a regular feature, but I was able to, uh, the first year that I interceded cover crops, we were able to get a custom grazing arrangement and everything just worked amazingly well that year. So um, I'm very fortunate that I had a good experience the first year I tried interceding and um, I'd like to think that I would have stayed with it if it hadn't gone quite that well, but we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, just wanted to mention, uh, I do a little other side project farming. Also, I raise some uh, heritage breed pigs on pasture and woodland. And that's something that I'm hoping to somehow integrate with my cropping system at some point. Uh, I'm going to start experimenting with that this year, but I can see how interseeding is something that could help to facilitate that. Uh, so as I mentioned, when I started uh, back in 2006 is when I came back to Blue Earth. Uh, Blue Earth, Minnesota is where I farm. I don't know if I mentioned that. Uh, my dad, Ken, had started uh, no-till seeding the beans back. He had already been doing that for probably, oh, a good 10 years or so by the time I moved back. So that kind of gave us a, a leg up. Um, he's always been fairly progressive as far as uh, soil conservation, I would call it, goes. Uh, he used to do some ridge till, but um, on all of our ground going into corn, and we're still pretty much a 50-50 corn soybean rotation farm, uh, all that corn ground got chisel plowed in the fall and then field cultivator in the spring. So yeah, we were dealing with the the uh, corn and soybean desert there <laughs> in the spring and I got interested in trying out some of this cover crop stuff it was difficult even you know that's not that long ago just to find people doing interseeding and um, thankfully there's so many more people out there now you probably have somebody in your neighborhood everybody watching this so I encourage you to reach out to them uh, this was the photo on the, the right there is our first uh, attempt. Uh, let's see. No, that wouldn't be the first attempt. That was after beans. Our first try uh, at strip tilling, which uh, is what we've moved to now away from the, the chisel plow field cultivator. And like Jerry was saying, I'd like to uh, go down that no-till path. Uh, we're going to definitely be experimenting with that. So. Uh, you're going to probably hear this uh, pounded into your heads again and again. Anything with cover crops or soil health is uh, understand your goals. And really, that's where you start. And uh, just the other thing I emphasize is please, please, everybody just try something if you haven't done it yet. Um, there's getting to be so much good information out there. Just get your stuff together and uh, <laughs> do something, even if it's 20 acres. Um, I'll just leave that part at that. Uh, I see there's like 90 some people watching this. So that's awesome. If, uh, I don't know how many of you have are farmers and have done this yet, but let's just say half of you haven't done this yet. Uh, get out there and do it. And going back to understanding those goals and understanding how to get started, you know, really keep in mind what your resources are, uh, you know, where are your personal uh, bottlenecks? Uh, how are you going to make this work? Um, one concept I'm just going to touch on here really quick is 
I used to hear a lot with soil health, uh, people would say start on your worst fields first because you have the most to gain and the least to lose. And I still do agree to with that to some point, but you could also make the point that in some cases you might want to do some things on your best ground. It's really good to, to try both. Uh, if you have some really good crop ground, uh, I think this interseeding, you're, you're probably using less, uh, less herbicide, less inputs. You know, again, you have to look at the history with that herbicide for sure, but try it on some of the better ground. You might have uh, some earlier successes um, on the worst ground. You know, if it's tight uh, soil that doesn't let that seed into the ground as easy, you might need to rely on more incorporation or, you know, if that system is just too degraded, it to really jumpstart things, you might have to take a more aggressive approach. And maybe that's where you want to do your, your worst fields first, if you're going to, you know, really get serious about, you know, big, big mixes of cover crops and things, changes in the rotation, things beyond just uh, this interceding concept. So think about that. And then again, develop uh, your systems approach. What, what's kind of holding you back right now? Make sure you have that seed ready to go when you need it, uh, have the help you need. Uh, again, reach out to farmers in your neighborhood. Um, any one of us, I'll have my contact information on the last slide here. Uh, I'm going to keep this short though, so we'll keep going. And I mentioned understanding your goals. Now, I think soil health principles, obviously they'll, they'll tackle a whole wide array, you know, anything from shrinking those, those wet areas in your fields to feeding ruminants, uh, you know, just all these things, they'll, they'll do it all. <laughs> I know that's not what we're supposed to say. They'll do it all, but they're not going to do it all at once. And you really do need to focus where you're going to start that at. Uh, I wanted to share this because this is after just a couple seasons. Uh, we we split the field. We had 50 acres that we did the the cover crops and the grazing on, and kept that up for a couple seasons. Reduced the tillage and we could already start to see that soil, you know, better aggregation. Um, and that's, I believe one of the big reasons I do this is because of water quality. And when you get those soil aggregates, think about uh, like pouring water into a bowl of marbles and then think about pouring water into a bowl of pudding that one on the right, that's gonna fall apart. That's gonna be more like that pudding. And that's why our rivers are gross. We have all this sediment that's just piling up. And if we, if we all made our soil more like marbles, I think we could see a drastic change and just be better for everybody. Um, not to mention getting our equipment over the field, just less headaches. Uh, I even think when you get to that point of aggregation, you're Interseeding is going to probably work better because there's just more pore space, uh, more earthworm activity. Um, I know Jerry for sure mentioned the, the planting green, and I think uh, taking approaches like that can uh, get more, more residue on the, the surface and just uh, help to get these interseeded crops to, to germinate better and Keeping that soil cool is so important, which uh, that's what he was talking about there. We see about a 20 degree difference here between cover crops and no cover crops. And in addition to just the corn plant wanting to shut down when the soil conditions get too hot, all the microbes in the soil, the ones that build those aggregates, they, they do the same thing. They, they follow this curve as it gets hotter and hotter. They more and more of them shut down and eventually you just don't have much happening in, in there anymore. And that's when uh, you're no longer mineralizing uh, nitrogen. You're not, you know, moving nutrients and water around. So um, 
this is why we're doing this. Uh, just another photo there of the cattle. And I think, let me see if it's my next slide. Nope. Uh, yeah, again, it worked so, so well that first year. I don't know what it was, just great conditions. I actually interceded kind of late. Um, we had a really mild uh, November, a lot of rain in the fall. So I think all those things contributed to really good luck there. And as you can see, there, it's not really over dominated by the brassicas. I think that was a really good mix. Um, I just wanted to mention here, uh, this is something we've been playing around with, this wide row corn. And one thing you'll notice in this photo, um, again, on the detail of working to uh, get that mix right in terms of your, your grasses, uh, legumes, and other forbs like the brassicas, uh, you can see it's kind of dominated by brassicas there. And I think part of that was uh, that additional sunlight. They they really did well. Uh, next time I do something like that, I'm going to up the grasses a bit. And in addition to just the sunlight, that'll change as your, so your, cho your soils change as well, is a detail uh, people who have taught me um, have mentioned before. Uh, yeah, equipment here. <laughs> so this is the very first year. Uh, kind of sucked doing uh, four rows at a time. <laughs> I think we would have been better off with the uh, uh, four-wheeler type of arrangement. We would have ran down a lot of less, lot less corn, but this thing got the job done and great results. Uh, the next year we moved on to something uh, more like that uh, Gandhi rig of Tom Cotter's that TJ showed. I don't have a photo of that machine. Uh, here, this is, uh, again, how, how good things can turn out, even seated late, but don't, uh, you know, unless you really get things figured out better than I do, don't, don't uh, count on that every year, but it's sure nice when we do see it. And I, I hope we can all work together and get to a situation where we, we do start to see results like this more consistently. And I think we will. Uh, photo here of uh, a mix uh, really blown up, but most of you probably know that a lot of these seeds are very small. Annual ryegrass, one of the staples is a tiny seed, those brassicas, very small clover. Uh, this works good for seeding into standing crops because you can carry, depending on your equipment, of course, you can potentially carry a lot of seed out there with you and it just makes the logistics a little easier to approach you can you know see it 100 acres and just you know fiddle with uh, 50 pound bags if you need to um, this is the the rig i used last year it'd be nice if it was a little wider again but uh, I, I found i was able to cut my, my uh, seed rate back you know, i still did 19 pounds an acre which is i think fairly high for being drilled like this uh, but excellent results. Uh, this particular field, we decided to skip the second herbicide for a, a big portion in the middle. So I was able to get out there nice and early and do this. And you can see the, the amount of residue there that uh, just helped to hold that moisture in and probably kept that soil nice and cool. And I believe it's my next slide here. You can see you know, how much growth we got on that before the corn really canopied. And I was so happy with the results in this field and other photos, the same farm there at harvest. And um, one thing we did here, which, you know, I think you can go down this path as you uh, do more of these kind of things. Uh, we cut out the seed treatment and, you know, I'd recommend being cautious with that, but we, planted uh, a bit later than normal, like maybe a week or two after the rest of our, our other corn. Um, if you recall this last spring, we had kind of a, a cool stretch there and I'm glad we waited until that was over, but uh, I planted a, a treated seed right alongside a non-treated of the same, uh, same variety and testing several strips going across the field, we had the same yield actually yielded a 
couple bushels higher in the untreated. I don't know if that's uh, of any statistical significance, but uh, great results there. And I did want to keep it really short. So <laughs> here's uh, my contact information and Oh, with the drill, I, I just wanted to reemphasize uh, Jerry's point. That's something I, uh, a detail I picked up this year from uh, Grant and Don Brightcretes. If you're going to use a drill and you can't uh, fit all the row units, the coulters between the rows, or if you have extra openings in your drill, just, yeah, leave the hose there. I wish I would have thought of that when I was uh, out interceding this spring. I think I could have had an even better stand in some of those places. So don't forget, don't forget to keep learning little stuff, little things like that. Uh, thanks. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Scott. That was really informative. Awesome. All right. And now next up, uh, we have Ed and I'm going to bring up his information and let him tell you guys about how he's been using it. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share our experience with you. Uh, so I farm over in Goodyear County, over on the southeast side of the state, about 18 miles off the Mississippi River. And uh, our farm is at the top of three watersheds, so um, we typically don't have to deal with other people's water. Um, those of you that uh, get the farmer magazine you probably saw the picture that's on the slide there <clears throat> and uh, they misprinted that uh, I don't have a son named Aaron I have a son named Samuel so um, <clears throat> I guess I've, I've got a lot of similar discussion that's already been covered so uh, some of these slides will be able to roll through pretty good so Jennifer if you want to advance so when I'm talking to people about cover crop interseeding, um, what can cover crops do for you? Fill in the blank. Um, the bare ground has the potential for the erode with soils and loss of nutrients. Uh, you wanna be able to keep it weed free until the canopy, but what about late season weed escapes for a herbicide program? And of course, will I have enough nutrients for the cash crop? and for the cover crops, which is what the crop insurance people are always worried about. So next slide. So when you're talking to people, it's just like, I kind of come up with the five, what the heck are you doing? Um, so the first thing is, you know, different cover crops are gonna be different on whether you have sandy soil, loam, clay, or even muck type of seed you want, single or, species or a mix, what kind of rate or pounds per acre. Size does matter when it comes to the seed as far as getting it in the ground. You know, smaller seeds, shallower. Larger seeds probably need to go deeper, which need lends itself to being incorporated. And what do you really want to do with that cover crop? Um, do you want to use it as, as a feed source, as another cash crop to sell to a livestock producer? As I mentioned before, the uh, helps with the weed suppression, <laughs> adds organic matter to the ground, and it helps break up the compaction um, that we see with some of the situations where you, a couple of years down the road after you started using a cover crop, um, your soil starts acting a little different. Uh, we've touched on a little bit on, you know, how do you get this stuff in the ground, you know, homemade modify what you have, you've seen that already. Um, aerial application, you know, airplane helicopter, now there's a drone that's available and then also high clearance, um, which was already talked about earlier. And who's doing it? Um, if you don't feel comfortable trying it off the start, hire somebody that does. And as alluded to with earlier speakers, Timing is everything for getting this cover crop in the ground and off and growing. Next slide. So this is uh, the cover crop mix that we kind of base, start with. Um, 
annual ryegrass, the purple top turnip, the radish, a couple of different clovers in there. Uh, we tried teff and kale, uh, you know, 28 pounds of seed and it costs us about $31 an acre. But you see most of that seed is all relatively the same size, so it should go through the same size meter. Um, if you had a drill with grass seeder on it that you were maybe pulling row units off of, you would put, you know, the smaller seeds up in the front and maybe something uh, bigger seeds in the back. Try to adjust your rates a little bit that way. So next slide. So my experience with the with the seeding cover crops, um, interseeding, I should say. So we started in uh, 2014. Uh, we were going into corn with grain with an airplane. We we're seeding it September one, and I really wanted to use triticale and winter peas because I wanted something that would be available in the spring for forage. But uh, there again, fairly large seed. Trying to put it on with an airplane to get it down through a canopy did not get a very good stand. So the next year we tried it maybe with a helicopter a little bit earlier, same seed mix, hoping for a better situation, didn't happen. Uh, so then we went to basically planting earlier soybeans um, and then using a no-till drill to seed after harvest. Um, we had a pretty good results that first year. Second year we tried it again. Um, didn't have the greatest fall for that. So had a poor situation with that. Tried it again uh, with the same mix because we're still trying to get that benefit of having a uh, winter uh, grain crop to, uh, to uh, work with in the spring. So in 2019, we started a corn row study with the University of Minnesota and the uh, Canada River Partnership looking at 30 inch and 60 inch and then a, what they call a balance, which is a 90 inch uh, corn roll study. And then I use the modified anhydrous bar with an air tank for seeding early at V5. But that year um, corn was, we were barely getting the corn in the ground by the 1st of June. So at V5, we were at the 20th of June. And there again, we put in that mix um, that we had talked about earlier. Um, the brassicas really, with the amount of sunlight they were getting in the wide spacings really took off. But uh, in the narrow rows, we had very little uh, growth. So then last year we did the same thing, but we were able to get the corn and plant it in April. So now we were doing our, our and we were doing our interest seeding on May 18th uh, with the same mix tweaking back the, uh, the kale, taking out the teff. And um, I would have to say we had a little bit better results on that. Uh, next slide. So this is the interseeder that I use. Um, it's basically, I uh, basically bought everything off the internet. Um, it's a used anhydrous bar with coulters. Uh, it has a uh, uh, Velmar air tank on it holds about 500 pounds of seed. And then I was able to get a hold of some vertical till coulters that uh, up in the Red River Valley, they use them for uh, chisel plows to do some vertical till, but most of them took them off and threw them in the corner of the shed. So um, Yetter still makes them. They're about $400 a piece new. And then I had a machine shop, um, uh, machine a block for me so I could mount that coulter to an anhydrous shank and uh, then we drop the hoses down in between that. So we basically have a rooster tail with that, that the seed falls into underneath. And so we end up getting the seed seeded at a, about a quarter of an inch into the ground. Next slide. So this is what that uh, a drone shot of that interseeding looks like. Um, so we had 30 inches with no cover 30 inches with a cover, 60 inch, which is basically shutting every other row off in the planter. And then what we're calling a balance, which is you plant 
four thirties and then shut off two rows to get a 90 inch gap. Um, and then those are the populations of this, trying to maintain that, that uh, 34,500 plants per acre when you change all that. So uh, the corn, you know, in that 60 inch row, that's, uh, we're finding that's a very heavy population um, for that to deal with. We even kind of think that the, uh, the balance probably is plenty high on that too, that we could probably pull that back a little bit. And, and we think we might have a little bit better uh, results on, uh, on whether that looks. So I'm gonna flip to the next slide. So this is kind of what that seed looks like um, in 2019 when we were seeding. Um, you know, we had pretty good results with it. Um, you can see how thick that looks. So in 30 inch rows, there's, there's, there is sunlight getting through there, but you have to look at length of day um, for when you're looking at those shadows, but you can still see how much sunlight does get through to the ground. And uh, I think the grass seems to do okay in that. Um, I don't think the broadleafs, the brassicas like that much shade. So I think, you know, once you open that canopy up, you get to, to quite a bit of more expression of that. Um, next slide. So this is a drone shot of the, of the balance rows there on the left. Uh, you can see, you know, that ground is, you know, we're collecting lots of solar energy in that. And then the drone shot on the right is uh, just before harvest, you know, that corn is ready to combine and, and uh, we got, there's green all the way down through there. Um, if you look on the far right side of that right picture, that's where I had a planter hiccup that uh, we had a skip with the planter. Um, and so I still just planted the cover crops right through there. So you, you know, pretend, you know, that's what it would look like if the whole field would have been covered in cover crops it would be that green um, on the last week of October. So I, if you want to jump to the last page, it's kind of Went through the slides pretty good. They were, like I said, a lot of this has already been covered, but uh, you know, this research project wouldn't be of possible without the cooperation of the University of Minnesota, the Canada River Partnership, Minnesota Department of Ag, uh, the Goodyear Soil Water Conservation District, and then Cedar Valley Innovations out of uh, Waterloo, Iowa. So um, there's my contact email, and uh, I guess I will. Um, end it there and, and uh, be available for questions later. Thank you so much, Ed. That was fantastic. You had a lot of great information in there. And when I was out at Ed's last August, oh my gosh, it looked fantastic and all the research that they're doing um, and bringing in all these different uh, options for equipment, seating, timing, things like that. Uh, it's really neat all the work that they're doing over there uh, to help us all learn so that we can figure out, you know, what will work best for us. So thank you very much. And now, next up, last and definitely not least, Matt Elford. Thank you. For all right. <laughs> I'll share my screen here, hopefully. Are you guys seeing a green bar? I had a green bar <laughs> around oh, yeah. my screen. Yeah, let's test it. How's that look? Perfect. Better? Perfect, yeah. All right. Sorry, you're dealing with amateur hour here, everybody. Bear with me. All right, we'll jump right in. Um, so this is our rig right here that we've used. Um, and I, just like everyone else, uh, I started with a, a hand crank deal hanging over my, my shoulder on headlands and stuff. 
that were pretty beat up from truck traffic and stuff. So we wanted to see what would grow there and, and what kind of benefits we could see from doing that. Saw some good things. So anyway, we had this side dress rig and my father-in-law had been using that to side dress nitrogen for a long time. And I, I don't remember the exact year, I believe it was four years ago. Then we added the Hineker box um, and started blowing seed as well. I added, I added an extension last year. So the, the box holds 50 cubic foot now, depending on your mix, you're looking at 1800 pounds-ish to a ton. So it works pretty well. I can get two fills of 32% of um, to one fill of seed. So I'm doing 75 to 80 acres um, worth of seed. Um, I recently added these, these Dawn Duo seeds on the end. We'll talk about those more, but so we didn't have a, a fertilizer unit on the end. And we, the first couple of years I broadcasted seed on the ends and I could see a, a huge stark difference um, in incorporated seed versus nothing. So I added a dual seed unit on both ends and those have been extremely impressive this far. We'll talk more about that in details, but there's just an overview of the rig we've been using. Real quick background, I'll fly through this. We farm a little over 1300 acres with corn and soybeans. Been strip tilling since 2009, um, been no tilling the vast majority of our, of our soybeans, depending upon fertility uh, the last couple of years. We started using covers in 13. I've been using them um, in different ways ever since, various methods and application methods, species, all that good stuff. And we started playing with interseeding in 17 was the first year. Um, let's see, last year would have been 100%. And this year will be 100%. The year before that was probably 40%. So we've seen some merits and it works really good when we're making that, that uh, side dress application anyway. Uh, we're doing it at the same time. It's a little bit more logistical issues, but we've been making that part of it work. I'm going to move my screen here. So interceding, side dressing. Um, oops, my bad. Have realis realistic expectations. You're not going to grow 3,000 pounds of biomass interseeding into corn into 230 bushel type of a corn crop. You're just not going to do that. Ed showed pictures. Everybody showed pictures. You can get some good growth. There's some real benefits, but just be realistic. You probably see pictures on the internet and things of that nature, and you're not going to have this huge, just gargantuan lush cover crop from fence line to fence line. Just be realistic in what you're trying to do so you're not disappointed. It, again, there is benefits and you can make this work. Just be realis realistic in what you're gonna expect. Earlier, the better, everybody's touched on it. V3 is better than V5. Uh, V3 is the earliest I've been able to do it. Just logistically, I think you can go to V2 with very little or no penalty, yield penalty. Um, anything past V5, I would cut bait and wait till a, a more a late summer fall harvest. Uh, we've done it at V7 and there's just, you're not gonna get much growth. Um, it's really not worth your money. So we've kind of touched on some of this other stuff already, but so what I'm doing is I'm blowing seed from the Hineker, obviously it's blowing right down between these containment coulters. And I did have a deflector on there. Or what I have been using, there's a deflector. So it blows it back as well and it fans out. So I get row to row coverage. So part of it gets incorporated and part of it does not. And we'll talk about that more um, and how that compares with the Don units on the end. Herbicides, and that's to start here because if your herbicides aren't right, nothing else is gonna work with this. So um, let me move this. Okay. That's better. No, I don't have that thing bugging me. Pre-emerge. Uh, these are ones that I've actually used and have actual experience with. There's probably others that will work as well, but these are the ones I have experience with. So verdict uh, 10 to 12 ounces has worked extremely well. Um, the problem is, or I guess the reason I went away from verdict is cost. It's expensive. It's expensive. And then we're planting almost all non-GMO corn and we need some more grass residual. So we've been using um, acetochlor products, harness extra, uh, quit using that uh, to get rid of the atrazine. But we used that one year at two and a half pints. And I actually had, actually had harness extra 
and uh, verdict side by side one year just for comparison to see how my inner seed would do and i saw no difference even there's three quarters of a pound of atrazine um, in that harness extra and my current program i'm running a pint and a half of harness pre-emerge um, with a roundup or a little 2,4-D depending on how things work out post-emerge i've been you know if you if, again if you round up corn roundup and status works very well uh, status two and a half to three ounces you can seed within two three days um, because you've got that time from seeding to germination uh, gives you an extra window in there um, any dicamba product works very well for your post uh, again non-gmo corn i've been using primarily lotus and that is kind of my go-to that is my current um, product i'm using three ounces of lotus and it's generally been about five days before I've got back to seed. And that's just, again, logistics, just by the time I, I get everything side dressed, um, that's just how long I've, I've gotten back to it. And I have even added, again, just for comparison's sake, I have added a quarter pound of atrazine on headlands if I've got a little more grass pressure or whatever. And I know that's not supposed to work, but I wanted to see it for myself. And I really couldn't tell a difference where I added the atrazine or not. Um, so I think it's very site specific. It's gonna be moisture specific. It's gonna be organic matter specific. It's all gonna, I mean, year to year that can fluctuate. And then of course, how biologically active your soils are. The more biologically active the soils you are, your soils are, the faster it's gonna chew through residuals. So I can't say that everyone could do that, but I happened to, it worked out that year. Uh, species, looking at species, do you have a goal in mind? Uh, I know when we've, if we knew we were going to corn on corn, we would be heavy on the legumes and brassicas. Uh, we've used hairy vetch in that situation, had it overwinter pretty well, and then we just delayed termination till like V3 and let it grow a while. And that worked pretty well. Again, it's planning ahead though. You have to be able to do that and just try and have an idea um, what every species you're looking at, what it's going to do, and why you're using it, and not just putting it in because this is what um, someone else said they're they're using it for. And at the bottom, I won't go over those, but those are just some of the species that I, I have played with with interseeding. These are some of my favorites, uh, I guess that I found to work the best, and some of the rates I'm using them as. And I won't probably break these down in detail. You guys can obviously read, um, but. Annual rye has been talked about many times, very shade tolerant, probably the most consistent. Uh, although I would say buckwheat is probably my favorite um, species to intercede, uh, especially when you talk consistency. So most everyone thinks about when we intercede, you're talking when the corn is senescing, when it's dying to the end, you just get it established early, it goes dormant, and then it comes on when the canopy opens up. Buckwheat does the opposite. It's not shade tolerant. It will die under the canopy, but buckwheat grows very rapidly, um, extremely fast growth. It will grow and it will actually bloom. If you get it in that V3 to V5 timeframe, it can grow and bloom by the time uh, that corn canopies, uh, which it, at that time, it's time to terminate a cover crop anyway, because you don't want it going reproductive and taking nutrients, moisture, all that stuff to make seed. So ideally, so I think buckwheat is, is like the ticket for interseeding in my opinion, because it really fits well. And by, the, by, by fall, it's melted away, it's gone. Low carbon nitrogen ratio, it's getting returned very quickly. So I really like buckwheat. Iron and clay cowpeas works well. They actually do pretty well under the shade. Again, adding, a, adding a, um, some, a nitrogen fixer, lost the word there for a second shade tolerant do well under the shade problems with them are bigger seed and cost flax added flax this year just at a pound but flax actually did very well um, handled the shade again a uh, very good host for mycorrhiza fungi and another pollinator attractor i'm not a huge fan of the brassicas they're very cheap and it makes sense to throw them in a lot of times i don't see much of them but there have been years where the canopy starts to die down then all of a sudden the brassicas are everywhere. You didn't even know they were there and they show up late in the year. So they're worth putting in just simply for the price point and the fact that some years they do show up. Uh, I already talked about cowpeas, but buckwheat, the downfall with buckwheat is it can go to seed. 
So headlands, anywhere it gets sunlight, if it, if it doesn't get terminated by the canopy, essentially, it can and will go to seed. This past year, or some of the years we had drownouts, uh, we had solid stands of buckwheat the following year. Not a big deal. It's really uncompetitive. I've had buckwheat and soybeans completely. You couldn't see a soybean from the buckwheat plant. Came back with the post pass and just fried it. And those beans just look unbelievably green and lush all year long and they actually stuck out. So I think there's actually some good things that happens there. That's not a, that's just anecdotal, just stuff I've observed. It's not anything I would recommend trying. Um, and buckwheat is supposed to be very chemically sensitive, easy to terminate. That is true as long as it's actively growing. So early in the year, it will not, it will be up and growing, but it will not be actively growing because temperatures are not warm enough and you cannot kill it at that point. But again, you can come back with your post and generally clean it up uh, very easily. Uh, cereal rye. We, I've actually, cereal rye can work. Uh, I think it's got to be in the right situation. People already talked about hybrids. That is a big deal and especially critical to make cereal rye work. This was the first year we did it in 17. And this is a hybrid break right here. If you can see that. So this was 19 pounds of cereal rye interseeded. There was some other stuff with it, but that was cereal. Um, this was a decalb hybrid that was really, it's really upright and is honestly just an ugly corn. It was not pretty. Uh, and you can see it, it worked, it held on, um, was there the next spring. This was Pioneer 0157, a lot leafier, a lot prettier corn. And we didn't have much. Um, that was the only hybrid it worked. It was across three hybrids, I believed. So still, I'm not giving up on cereal rye. This was the past year on the right-hand side. I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor, but on the right-hand side, uh, that was this past year. And again, that's the Don du dual seed unit. Um, extremely impressive. And most of that, that was like 20 pounds, 20 pounds of cereal rye. And I believe there was five pounds of annual in there with it. So the vast majority of that grass is, is cereal. And most of that was still around this fall. Um, so I did some experimentation. I dropped pops to 28 to 32 um, because realistically, I don't know what everyone's yield goals are, but you can grow 230 to 250 bushel corn uh, at 28,000 or even less sometimes, 32 easily. So I don't think we always need the population we think we do, which opens up avenues to do some of this other stuff. Uh, seed to soil contact, I think is imperative. Broadcasting can work, uh, it, it has worked, but if you want year to year consistency and it's gonna work every year and you're gonna get that investment back from your seed, I think you gotta be putting it in the ground Somehow it's got to be incorporated somehow. So this was uh, this was a corn on corn farm, and this was the Don Dual Seed Unit. I, I should have put the date on here, but this obviously the corn's dying down. It's September some point. Here's the Dual Seed Unit. You can see how much growth we got. Here's my Coulter Unit. I was still getting some some incorporation there, but by putting the seed in with a drill type of unit, I'm putting it directly into moisture. And, and this was a deal this year was probably the worst interseeding results I've had. Uh, I ran hard for three days. There was a hundred percent chance of one to three inches, I think immediately following and we got nothing. So the seed that was lightly incorporated, some of it got a little moisture, uh, but the seed that I used the dual seed, a drill type of unit, and it was stuck in the ground and got put into moisture, did extremely well, but the seed that did not, Obviously, it was less than desirable. So I think that's extremely important because Jerry talked about it. Everyone's talked about it. There is such a narrow window from when that we're talking about that rapid growth time in corn where it just explodes and you're trying to get this stuff established right before it does that or the game's over. So if you want consistent results, I really think it's got to be um, put in the ground somehow. Here's just some progression photos. Uh, this was July 6th. You can see the buckwheat doing very well. By the 14th, it's blooming. Like I said, we're getting blooms. And then by the 4th, everything's pretty much dead. This didn't have any cowpeas in it. This was two years ago, I think. I didn't have any cowpeas in this mix. But by the 4th, we've just got our annual ryegrass left. Um, yeah, oh yeah, there's the mix right there at the top of the page in the center that I used that year. Okay, this. I have to share this. This I listened to Mike Bredesen. 
at the National No-Till Conference last winter, um, and they they physically sampled insects um, from corn that was interseeded. So the orange bar is interseeded corn. The yellow bar or whatever color it shows up for you guys, the one that says monoculture, that is just corn that was not interseeded. So it's a monoculture of corn. And they physically sampled the insects on the soil surface, on the soil subsurface or in the soil, and then the percent of predators that were in those systems. And we'll talk about each one. So in the soil surface, um, you guys can read this, but there was almost 60% more insects on the soil surface in an interseeded corn crop. And also there was over double the amount of diversity. So they had more species and more total numbers. In the soil, it wasn't quite as drastic, but it was still almost 30% more insects um, in the soil with interseeded cover crops. And okay, that's great. We're, we're bringing more bugs into our system, into our fields, obviously, but are they good? Are they bad? Is it a good thing? Um, that's a question I, I never really knew because I can see some, some excessive, some feeding on some of my buckwheat and some of, some of my interseeded cover crops that I normally don't see. And I've always wondered that. But this um, predator number, I think, uh, really gives good indication as to what's going on. So they actually saw a 50% increase in predators in the system. And predatory insects, as far as I know, I'm not an entomologist or an expert, but they're almost always good ones because they're going to prey on the less desirables. Your aphids and, and some of those, I mean, garbage collectors, generally ones that are pests. So we like predators in our system. Predators are a good thing. And so I think by doing things like this, adding some diversity to our system, bringing different plants back in that we normally don't see in our monocultures, I think can have some serious benefits that are really hard to quantify, but this is one where we actually saw some numbers put to that. Okay, I'll try and wrap it up. Um, from what I've seen, I've had no yield penalty ever interceding. I've seen the latter actually. Um, replicated average, this was a 2018 trial I did. I saw on average a little over a bushel, nothing crazy, but I have consistently seen a benefit to interseeding. I've seen up to six bushel where I have not had to spray a post. If um, the picture in the background, that's plant, that was planting corn this past year in the triticale, um, and I, we did not spray a post emerge on that at all. Um, and I'll talk about that, but I think Interseeding really works if you earn the right to do it and you earn the right to do it by planting green into a living growing cover crop that is going to suppress your weeds. Then you can put a, a partial rate of a pre-emerge and you don't have to fight that logistical issue of trying to spray and interseed at the same time with weather, you're dealing with a tight window. So I think if you can do that, that is the best way to get to interseeding. And again, everyone's situation that's not gonna work depending on weed pressure and histories and all that good stuff. But that is I the ideal way to interseed. Um, I put the little note there, does interseed equal no insecticide? I'm not gonna say that with 100% certainty, but we've been doing non-GMO corn for three years now. Um, we haven't used an ounce of insecticide over the top or in furrow. We've done corn on corn with zero insecticide. We've seen some bugs, some, some insects, not much for what worm. I put sticky traps out every year, but we've never seen anything even close to economically damaging thresholds that we've had to spray for. Is that because of some of what we're doing with interseed and diversity of insects and stuff? I don't know, I'm not gonna make that claim, but because I, I probably will not use non-GMO corn if I have to go to full out insecticide. I just don't wanna deal with that stuff anymore. So. I think there's some serious benefits um, that we maybe don't always talk about with some of this other stuff. Going forward, I'm gonna to continue to use some cereal rye, keep playing with that, seeing if I can make that work, if I can maintain my yields by dropping my populations, pick flex hybrids, things of that nature. Um, but as of next year, uh, I'm gonna just use larger seeds, um, my cowpeas, my buckwheat, I'll probably use a little annual, and I'm going to aggressively incorporate. I'm not gonna, blow the seed back anymore to where part of it gets broadcasted. I'm just gonna dump it right between my coulters, get it aggressively incorporated because that from what I have seen to make this consistently work is the most important thing. And then I'm gonna just save a large chunk of my money and come back with cereal rye over the top later in the summer with either a plane or a ground rig. 
Um, with that, that's about all I got. My contact info is at the bottom and I probably used more time than I was supposed to. So thanks guys. That's perfect. That was a lot of really, really great information, um, you know, to see how things go throughout the year. And looking at the, the soil biology, that is really neat too. That I hadn't seen those charts. So that's, that's very cool to be able to see that. Um, all right, so now thank you to all of our speakers for presenting this great information. Um, I think we'll get right into asking some questions. So there were some questions um, entered in the chat box. Uh, the first one, Jerry, um, what was what was your interseeding mix, your species and seeding rate? Could you repeat that for me, Jennifer? Yeah, your your interseeding uh, mix, uh, your species and your seeding rate that you usually go with. This is what we used last year was five pounds of annual rye, a pound of radish, a pound of purple top turnip, a pound of rape, a pound of buckwheat and a half pound of clover. But now remember, we're coming back, we're flying it on uh, 35 pounds of cereal rye broadcast. And that's uh, usually around the end of August when the corn starts drying down, uh, first part of September. And it's worked well for us. Uh, we come back and plant our beans uh, green and we've even, that's one of the mother screw ups where you find something good comes out of it. A couple of years ago, we were gonna have one field that was corn on corn and then with all the ground out and everything, it was like, okay, we can't plant that much corn. So we switched it to beans. And of course I forgot to tell a co-op to spray them when I sprayed the beans, they had to map for corn. And I told them, well, don't spray that. You know, we're gonna go to beans. So we got done with our first cutting alfalfa and we're driving around and Nancy said, I don't think that cereal rice is dying very well. And I said, well, it was the last field planted, you know, and last field sprayed. Well, she goes home, checks the spray tickets and said that field never got sprayed. But what was interesting, the corn, the soybeans were already up, you know, probably six or eight inches tall and 35 pounds is not a real heavy rate, but yet it's enough to get good water infiltration and good weed control. And so now we're actually, our, my agronomist is running pest plots. We're actually letting our beans come up, probably get into that second or third trifoliate and then we're terminating our cereal rye. But what was interesting is we had a delegation from Hungary here and they wanted to learn about cover crops and no-till and and so we had a strip till rig here. We had a high clearance rig here. And of course they looked at my planter and my drill and they kicked it and the mud fell off. And I said, yeah, it was not pretty. We mudded everything in. But what was interesting when I got to that field here, they're digging up my soybeans. And they were just amazed at the nodulation on that soybeans. And my grandma said, well, I think you're onto something. I said, well, you know, David Brandt, he always tells me, uh, you know, starve them beans. So they nodulate more. And it seems to be working. We're not losing any yield. Uh, the other flip side of that is uh, weed control. Because after you terminate that cereal rye, basically, I think you got three to four weeks. Then you can see if you're in narrow row beans, you're almost canopied. We've even had some fields. The only thing we've did is terminate cereal rye. And that's our herbicide program for the year. Great. Excellent. Thank you. And then have you guys noticed, uh, you know, some people are going to more narrow row widths. Um, have you guys played around with like 22 inch um, for this inner seating? Or are you guys all on the 30 or the 60 inch? We're all 30 and I've played around with the 60. That's a great question though, because I, I, I'm hoping somebody know is somebody that's tried it on narrow rows. I haven't directly heard of anyone. I have a customer that has 22 inch rows and he's tried it. Uh, it's not the best. I'll be honest with you. Uh, you just don't get enough sunlight down in between. And then Matt, what was your rate of cereal rye uh, that you planted? Uh, it, in 17, it was 19 pounds. And I think I did 20 this year as well. Nothing crazy, but it, it, I'm still evaluating whether it's, it, I can make it work or not, basically. Yeah. Nice. And then do you guys use early, earlier maturing 
crops with this inner seeding? Are you going shorter days at all or? I mean, what was the question? If you're using, uh, you know, earlier maturing crops to get more growth out of your cover crops? Um, most of our corn, I would say our earliest is 95 and our latest is probably 102. I have had people have more problems with 105 day corn with the inner seeding. I think there, uh, really look at what your uh, broader goals are. Um, yeah, you might give up a little yield if you plant something closer to 90 day, but if you're trying to graze livestock on it, or if you have, you know, big plans for the, the following season, if you want to plant, you know, come back with a really heavy rate of cereal rye into that and try to eliminate some herbicide, eliminate or reduce some herbicide in your soybeans, it'd be a good strategy, but uh, I think it can be, it can be a benefit for sure. I've tried some, not super early corn, but you know, maybe around that 95 to 90 day and it can, it can help if you want more cover crop interseed growth. Yeah, I guess my comment would be, we haven't really gone extreme to a lot of hundred day and under, but we have grown some 110s and 112s before on really highly productive ground. And that has not worked as well especially if, you, if you're a fungicide person, you layer a fungicide on top of that, that plant stays green and leafy a long time. It really delays things for any type of cover crop growth. So generally 108 and under, and again, trying to pick the right type of hybrid as far as, as, far as your upright selection and all that stuff, your leaf orientation. Excellent. All right. And then another, has anyone done a side-by-side -side or neighborhood comparison using different kinds of seeding methods with this? And did you notice, um, I know, you know, you guys were talking about that some, um, and they're talking about like, as in a drill type versus one that uses a rotary hole um, or rolling cultivator with gangs to incorporate the seed. Um, is it mostly been like, like a year to year comparison or do we have any like within the same season comparisons and what you guys have seen? Well, I would say, you know, anything that incorporates is gonna be better. Uh, now I do have one customer who actually converted their cultivator and uh, took the rear shank off and put in like four drag times. And then just from the cultivator shovels maybe an inch or so deep and blow the seed on behind the shovels and then the drag and that works excellent. And I've got other ones who still broadcast it on top and they kind of just watch for rain or anything like that and go off broadcast it. But the majority do try and incorporate it and that's always going to be better. As Matt said, you know, you can even see the difference between uh, the row unit as far as just having the colder stir the dirt. Yeah, I think there's just a zillion variables there, but I agree you know, some incorporation is better than the none. Uh, I really liked that, uh, that drill I used this year had like a double disc opener and that uh, did excellent. Uh, but, you know, you've got things like earth, you know, in addition to just uh, precipitation, there's earthworm activity, there's soil aggregation, there's uh, the amount of residue on the surface, you know, whether you planted that crop green or not. Um, just so many variables. So I think to really test that out, you'd almost have to try several things in the same field on the same day. And but even there, I think you'd, you'd find that in a lot of situations, incorporation helps some, some type or another. Yeah. So the first year when I did it, the, on the end of my bar was just being broadcast and every other row you had uh, incorporation basically. And the rows, well, I got a rain like the day after I interceded the very first year. It was kind of ideal, a very good rain. And the rows that got incorporated, got mixed with soil, the buckwheat and cowpeas were up in three days. And the rows that were broadcasted, it still took at least a week before they even really were germinated and up and growing. So like Jerry and everyone has touched on how critical it is to get this stuff up and moving. You've got such a tight window that is that's a huge deal. And, and continuing with that, now that I've put a drill unit on, 
I've seen kind of the same thing. That's you get every seed germinated and it comes up and it just shoots out really quick. The soil's warm, but if it doesn't have moisture and it's not in the soil, it, it's going to sit there until you get the rain or you get the rain to move it down in or your whatever earthworms pull it down, which I have seen as well and incorporate it. So again, if you want year to year consistent results, I think it's been um, hammered home here, but that's the way to do it. I know, Ed, uh, this year, you know, we looked at some different seeding methods. What did you find that you like best uh, with those different options? Well, the moisture is so critical. I mean, it's just, you know, and that's why um, it's really tough to get anything growing in August or July because most of the time the plants just are sucking so much moisture out of the ground anyway. Um, you know, good luck with with the coulter system that I have now. Um, double disc with a with a press wheel behind. I guess that's the biggest concern. That yeah, we don't have it seed soil contact per se. Um, I guess if I was to try anything, I might try possibly running you know real wide press wheel behind what I've got now and see if I can get that cover crop to pop up even faster. But uh, there again, you know, if you come in late with a with a high boy, uh, you know, other than trying to stir it a little bit, I think crop residue uh, having a cover there, you're going to hold that moisture in. Uh, hopefully, it'll work. The seed small enough that it can work itself down through that uh, residue to uh, to get it off and going again. Excellent. Um, let's see, and we have some more questions. Brian Stefan, I don't know if you can unmute to ask your question, if you want to do that. or I will try my best. The mic on my laptop is not the greatest, so if I cut out, I apologize. Um, as, I guess my question kind of goes towards uh, the northern part of the state, and I know a lot of these guys are from the southern part of the state, but I guess more towards uh, dry pack manure and how to incorporate that within uh, a cover crop system. Um, we have an issue with our, we have a lot of cattle on the landscape in, our, in the two counties that I cover, and the main issue is how to incorporate manure into the ground, but yet yeah, try to have cover crop at the same time, I feel. So, uh, maybe a little bit more direction. Uh, it's hard to convince some of these guys to even, you know, put extra seed in the ground when it comes to that. So if anybody can kind of maybe a little bit of direction, that would be great. I guess I'll throw, I'll throw that. I'll throw the first volley across the bow anyway. Um, there again, the uh, rate of your pen pack, uh, what you're spreading it with and, um, you know, uh, these vertical till machines, uh, Great Plains and whatever, they have a cover crop box. You can basically put that right on there. Um, I guess I that's that's what I would, I, I know a couple guys here in Good Yukon that have the vertical till with a box on them. And, and it looks just like you went through there with a drill. So um, you got seed soil contact, you got a roller bar, a rolling basket on the back to break up any clumps. Um, you get the manure somewhat incorporated and uh, yeah I think I think that that would be the first place that I would start anyway so I'll let the other guys chime in. I have zero direct experience here but I can pass on something that I've heard from uh, the Soil Health Academy guys say uh, Gabe Brown and Alan Williams. Uh, they said uh, apply manure at a very you know the lightest rate possible and if possible it's always better to apply it to a, a living cover crop so i don't know if that would fit your situation at all but if you can get something established and then go spread your manure lightly over the top of that um just thought i'd pass that on i think what they have to deal with though is a lot of the times they're required to have that manure incorporated within 24 hours for pollution control or, you know, whatever their permit says so so that's part of the issue um the guys i know out in the chesapeake bay area they cannot apply any manure 
until they have a cover crop on that acre. So I know some guys in Wisconsin up by Green Bay, there again, take the corn silage off, basically chase the chopper out of the field with the, with the uh, getting the cover crop seeded or have it interseeded. And um, they can put manure on and then they're using low disturbance injection for liquid dairy manure. It's working great for them. They're getting good tonnage on their uh, rye that they're pulling off for feed then too. And then they're turning right around and planting no-till corn right back into that field again. So they're pulling two crops of forages off the same acre and applying up to, I think it's over 12,000 gallons of liquid dairy manure with the low disturbance injected bars. That's, that's all great info. Um, I guess the other thing too is uh, we're limited on when we can intercede. We, it doesn't make much sense for us to intercede in September with us being you know even north of the Brander Lakes area. Um, but uh, I've been talking to a lot of guys about trying to get in with that V2, V3 stage as much as possible. It's just the manure, op you know, just that incorporation that they're really sketchy about. A lot of these guys have anything from 300 to 500 cow calf pair. Um, so they're just running into that issue of, okay, am I going to have enough time type deal? So they, they know it's a good thing that they need to do. It's, um, it's just how to do it. But no, that's all great stuff. Thank you. I guess just, just to add a couple more thoughts on that. Um, so if you're trying to get this, I, I guess the first suggestion I would try, take 20 acres up there. <clears throat> and part of it is, is uh, proving it to, to the, the regulators. Um, so, so get the corn interseeded at V4 let it come up, take the grain off for silage or whatever. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we haven't touched at all on, on um, you know, how we're processing our, our corn. Uh, most of the pictures that I saw, you know, we're not running chopping heads. Um, if a guy has got, a, more than likely, if he's running beef cattle, he's probably pulling stocks off for petting. And if you got a living cover, cover crop in that, you're going to have some corn stock bales that are going to get hot on you because that that green stuff is going to is going to heat. So if you were to split your fields up into say you want to do half of your acres or whatever um, and plant the cover crop, but don't take the stocks off of it, and then lightly apply the manure to that at you know whatever rate, um, and try to show that we're not running those nutrients off because we have that growing cover underneath there. Um, it's a trade-off for, for having that stockpile of feed for, for bedding and that. So um, I think that would have to be managed a little bit that way, but those are my thoughts anyway on for, for dealing with livestock. I, I, I would still stick it in and I would try to prove to the regulators that, you know, if we apply this at this rate, we're not gonna have the runoff that you're worried about. You know, it's, it's, it's a good point. Um, a lot of them do chop, uh, not a lot of them bail, but a lot of it's silage, uh, especially with these bigger operations. So yep. it's a good point to have. And that was a lot of questions I've had too. Is it going to, is it going to clog up my chopper? And I nope. haven't really seen anything that's ever pointed to that being an issue. So it's nope. just being able to convince them and being like, yeah, that won't happen. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Just one more it, thought, uh, you know, why make so much manure in the first place? If we can get those yeah, raise it back out raise. onto the field. Yep. Prevent the problem. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. I, I completely agree. Uh, that's kind of the the whole reason why I'm trying to get this covers on here so we can put a temporary mm -hmm. fence on these fields and yep. move them across either pail feed or do whatever. Well, um, you basically leave them out there all winter. Yeah. Leave them all out there all winter and hopefully never have to start up a tractor to feed them uh, yep. either at a feedlot or what, or what have you. Uh, it's just that first initial startup really is what we're running into. They, they, they know they can get, you know, months of extra feed without even running a tractor or putting a bale out there. So that would be, right. that would be a nice start. Well, run, run the numbers on it to uh, have a farm business management or whoever have run the numbers and then have a meeting, you know, do a, do a trial within the, within the, within the county. And uh, you know, ask the soil and water to help your NRCS to uh, to help set it up, and uh, you know, bring in some some other guys 
farther north of you that are doing it up in the up in the Red River Valley. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, something something that can be done yet. All right. Thank you guys for all your answers. That's great. Thank you. Lance, you had a question. I actually have two questions. Um, curious if anybody's uh, played around with their nitrogen rates or they've kept it all consistent. And then the second one is more so a plug. Uh, I know Ed had a really nice field day in, was it August or September? And so just uh, hoping that some of you guys might be doing, willing to do the same here in 21, so. As far as nitrogen rate, we're still broadcasting, but now we're going to start looking at trying to um, use a wide drop and drop it down as opposed to feeding the cover crop and the corn to just feed the corn and see if we can keep our, uh, keep the corn yields up and let the brassicas do the uh, um, mining of, or the collecting of, of what's out there uh, rather than feeding them, even though we are feeding the forage, there should be enough there for them to find. I guess we haven't necessarily adjusted rates because of interseeding or anything of that nature, but we do put out a, a standard, a low and a high rate every year. And again, I had replicated trials for two years there, are, there of, of um, interseeded cover crop versus no, um, with the same nitrogen rate. Um, at like 135 pounds, so not a real high rate. And I, I again, I saw a zero yield penalty and I saw the opposite. So um, as far as needing extra nitrogen or anything of that nature, that was a worry of mine because in an ideal world, at least in my brain, I would be wide dropping. I wouldn't be putting that band of nitrogen directly under my cover crop. I would be, you know, indexing that, laying that right by my row instead of putting it in the center. So the corn crop has more advantage to it than the cover crop. But uh, so far that hasn't been an issue and it hasn't caused any more nitrogen or anything like that. I actually, uh, there was five farmers around here who participated, uh, that's been two years ago, I believe. And we did variable rates and replicated it, I believe five times, starting at a low of 80 pounds up to 220 pounds. And the economics of it said the best rate was between 140, 50 pound, 140 and 150 pounds of nitrogen for your return on investment. So I'll just share, uh, <clears throat> I agree with, uh, you know, we split all of our nitrogen and right now that side dress coulter is going right down the middle of the row and that's something I want to change. Uh, we haven't had, we didn't do like any tests where we did different rates though, at least consciously, <laughs> probably had some goof ups, but overall though, on our corn this year, we were only putting on 125 pounds of total nitrogen. And we probably could have got a few more bushels of corn if we would have put on another 10 or so, but uh, I'm pretty happy with, with what we got. And, you know, if I would have known that the corn price is going to come up this much, maybe we would have done things a little differently, but we're gonna stay in that 125 to 135 pound rates. And I think as we get more, more uh, soil biology and diversity into our system, uh, then we'll try to bring that down a little more even, but just uh, doing tests would be the best. <laughs> Something I wanna do more of. If other people have questions, this is a great time where you can unmute and ask your question too. Um, and then I'm going to ask, so we're really focusing on interseeding into corn. Have you guys played around with interseeding into soybeans? And what do you think about that? I love it. When uh, do you do Joel, it? Joel Jerk is on here. He did mine this year. Um, we went into standing soybeans that were basically up to my waist with his 90 foot machine and we put down 100 pounds of triticale on the uh, 30, 30th of August and then we got an inch and a half of rain within the next week and right now uh, I'm going to go out there this weekend now but right now I've got six inch tall uh, triticale that we plan on pulling off for forage and then turn it around and, and no tilling right back into that. 
Um, the agronomist, he, he almost ran off the road because he thought that they screwed up so bad spraying on that field that it had a, that it had a weed problem in it. But um, then he jokingly went and talked to the neighbors and the neighbors were all laughing at him because he didn't know about, oh, your weed program didn't work for that spot of the field. So, but um, I had a guy come in and, and combine my beans this fall for me because I had some issues with my combine. And he, he had no, I mean, 35 foot draper heads two rotary combines and they just, you know, the beans went 62 bushels to the acre. And, and he was, the field looks like my lawn when it, when he got done combining, it looked great. So I'm excited about uh, what's going to happen there in the next 60 days. Were those uh, 30 inch rows? Yep. And when did you put on the seed or what stage August, the beans at? Uh, the bottom leaves were just starting to turn yellow. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, I'm. I, I, I'm. A, I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm hoping that I can get Joe over to do some more. So, actually, fly on all of ours on our soybeans, and I want to do it when we start seeing about twenty percent yellow leaves because I want it green down there when we combine. Because both in eighteen and nineteen, we were so wet here. We got every acre of our soybeans combined. In fact, I combined through standing water in one field. It wasn't a very big. Area. But if you've got that cover crop growing, it's just like putting rebar in the soil when you got wet field. Yeah, we've had Andy Linder come in and do stuff for us up here. Um, we've, same thing, we try to go in that when we just start to see a leaf drop hit, keep him moving. And we've done a four-way species mix and it's been fairly successful what we've been doing. Uh, the other thing I've had a couple guys experiment with is we've gone into, into beans before they're starting to canopy over earlier and putting in some like strawberry clover, L-side clover, white dutch, something that's more of a low profile growing, growing clover. And we're on our second year of that. The first year was okay, we'll see what this year comes out like. One of them was a hailed field. After he got it done, it got hailed on. So we did get some more sunlight in there. But the other one fully canopied over and this fall it looked good. Now, like I said, I tried to do things for a couple of years before we talk about it a lot, but we'll see what this spring looks like. And they just want to, they're going to go back into corn. They just want a, a legume growing before corn. You guys notice any issues when you go to harvest the soybeans about getting dirty beans at all? No. Well, actually, um, it's in your cereal rise in its vegetative stage, so it's real flimsy. And you'll actually see it push over when a cutter bar gets there and it'll cut off the beans right at the ground and it'll stand up right behind it. And it looks like Lee said that interseeding into soybeans that leaf drop like first week of September works well. And they're using uh, winter wheat, 55 pounds, daikon radish, two pounds, sometimes turnips or rape, one to three pounds per acre. Excellent. Yeah, because that's, it's a great opportunity. And I know some people are hesitant just, you know, because of when you go to harvest uh, your soybeans, but Sounds like we haven't had any issues with that mixing in and making dirty beans. No. Somebody's asking about planting after beans. Uh, mind if I chime in here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe in an, uh, for me and in, in our system, and of course everybody's going to be different. Uh, in the perfect world, I would uh, have some some seed flown on or put in with like a wide enough unit. So because our beans are drilled on. Uh, typically 10 inch rows, although I might change that around a little bit this year. So I don't want to run down too many beans. Uh, but what I tried this year, and I'm really uh, excited to see the results, uh, is I went in with our the same drill I actually used to plant the beans. I moved some row units around and created some skip zones. And since we have RTK GPS, I seeded, uh, I think I set it up to around 80 pounds of cereal rye. Um, but I'm going in between where the corn rows are going to be next year. And I think that's going to work really well. Uh, again, I'm, it's my first time trying it because we did some uh, tried planting green last year into some uh, cereal rye fields. And I know our corn took a bit of a yield hit. We might have lost anywhere from 
from five, 10, maybe even there was one spot where we really delayed the termination and we might've given up like 15 there. It was just uh, 10 acres or so, but this uh, skip zone thing should help. And I know one thing that was mentioned earlier is uh, the differences between like how quick that seed gets established when you uh, direct seed it versus fly it on. So if you're getting, for whatever reason, you don't get that seed spread and maybe you're only a week away from harvest, I would recommend if you have a drill and the tractor and people, you know, the resources to get it done, you might be better off just drilling because uh, it'll get its feet under it, as they say, more quickly and you'd probably be better off. But why not both? <laughs> Scott, I got a question for you on your drill. Do you have, is that just a single box or do you have the ability to, with two boxes on there? It is just a single box. Okay. Because we get all these added Because what I was going to suggest that if you shut off your main box where your corn roll is going to go and where that corn roll is, is you put a brassica or a legume to drop straight down on there. Yeah. You can be basically bio. Um, uh, strip tilling and then you'd be able to plant right into that with your uh, with your corn planter if it if it worked out yeah that'd be cool so i see amy asked a question here what are recommendations in a v4 to v or v5 to v7 with irrigation uh, i know where amy's at in minnesota so they're a little bit farther north up into that lighter ground with irrigation i would definitely look at still using annual ryegrass I might back it down to like a 12 to 14 pound inclusion rate, leave the brassicas down to a quarter pound, get that get that clover at three pounds. So I'd probably look at right now at, with their irrigation, cause you're gonna get it established well, once you get it put on the, the moisture will kick in for you. Do that 12 to 14 pounds of ryegrass, go to a you know, quarter pound of kale, quarter pound to turn up and then, and then hit three pounds of red clover. And I think you get a really good stand out of that with irrigation, cause you're gonna get it to take off. Uh, then as they get more comfortable with it, they might want to go up rate of the ryegrass. They, if they're going to graze it, it's still a great grazing option for them. But otherwise, that's a good cover for them to start with on, on that inner seeding. But once again, make sure you know what the herbicides are because it could all get established and all be gone. And then Jim is I asking. Guess, oh, sorry. Ahead. I guess I was just going to chime in. Um, I think that that was, you know, the first couple of years that we were trying to do it. I think our herbicide program, we weren't paying attention to that. And I think uh, now, it, you know, we're learning. And I mean, it's a, it's a steep learning curve. And that's part of the reason I have these Zoom meetings is that um, if, we can, if we can just save one person from making that mistake, um, you know, they're that much farther ahead. And then we can, we can, uh, we're all losing our hair, so we don't have as much knowledge, or I should say, we have more knowledge than we have hair. So I guess uh, don't don't judge our uh, don't judge our hair by the amount of cover crop that we can grow. <laughs> I still have hair. What do you mean? <laughs> it's getting gray. Yeah, from growing cover crops. <laughs> <All right. laughs> questions, questions, questions. <laughs> This is this is this is vintage. This is this is that's what that is. It's a vintage area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, then we've got a question from Jim. What are you planting into the covers after beans? Whatever you guess want. Guess probably corn soybean rotation or yeah. Well, I think the guys hit on it mostly. You know, you could fly something in. Once again, you want to use a cereal. Um, I, I personally, I'm kind of on Ed's camp with the triticale from beans to corn. And it's not, it's not that we don't know how to manage rye in front of corn. I just, as an industry person, I get kind of, I push people this direction is if we do the same thing over and over and over and over again, use the same species all the time, we are going to have a problem at some point with a bug or a disease or a, or a combination where <laughs> if we, we, there's, we have a lot of tools in the toolbox for these cereals. Triticale, I know it's a little more expensive. If we put oats with it in the fall, it seems to stretch it out. It really works really well going in front of corn and then cereal rye in front of beans or the annual ryegrass in front of beans. And I think each one of them have merits, but if we can, 
<clears throat> just kind of mix it up a little bit so we're not doing the same thing over and over and over again. I think that's going to be better for us. We can manage cereal right in front of corn. That's not that big an issue. We got, I think we can handle that well. But why not we why don't we use something else just to break up the species so we don't do the same thing continuously? And maybe some of the farmers will say, Oh, you're nuts, just you know, <laughs> that's crazy. But um, you know, that's just my thought as an industry is try to utilize different things so we don't burn out this one product that's really like like Jerry said, it's bulletproof. I mean, if you can't make cereal rye work, you're really doing something wrong. <laughs> You've got something really messed up somewhere. You need to have a bigger Zoom meeting. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole that's that should be around the bar with a lot of beer at night. That's how that one gets sold. I will say one thing, you know, cereal rye in front of corn is not bad, but you wanna we're planting a green, but we're terminating right away after we're planting. Um, only exception to that was 2018 and 19. We couldn't plant. We actually, our rye was headed out almost by the time we planted, but we still got it terminated. It actually, I've got yield maps back to 2013 where we couldn't get in full of cereal rye. <clears throat> we actually gained 20 bushel an acre because that cereal rye was sucking up so, moisture, so much moisture that we got the corn crop going as compared to the half of the field that didn't have to cover on. So now are you guys, oh, sorry, go ahead. It kind of goes back to if it's a dry year, you terminate it early. If you have plenty of moisture, let it grow a little bit longer. But with corn, you almost have to terminate after you get the planter out of there because if you don't, it'll suck too much moisture and nutrients to the corn. Yeah, it, it, it'll really suck it out of the, the sea trench. You won't have enough moisture if you don't get that stuff terminated, you know, and, uh, you know, make sure you throw the nitrogen on it. I mean, that's, that's the, the thing that, that, that living rye is, it's got so much nitrogen sucked up with it that uh, we kind of learned that the hard way that um, you just didn't have enough nitrogen for that corn to get started right away. I second that. We're just adding uh, ex extra nitrogen capacity to our planter this year. And I see Jim had a follow-up question to, to clarify what he was asking. And hopefully we're, we're kind of addressing that. So yeah, watch the nitrogen, uh, you know, have a plan to terminate it. Strip tilling works. That's what we're still doing on, on my farm. And uh, there again, though, uh, strip tilling, uh, in the fall or the spring and that's going to depend on the the weather and your soils uh, we've done both on our farm and i i think doing that you know you can strip till into your cover in the fall you're going to dig up some of it uh the other thing we've noticed is if you uh one year we we had some cereal rye spread and then we like after the beans were off we just had a co-op come out with the fertilizer truck and do it and we strip tilled immediately after that and it kind of had the effect of pushing the the rye seed off to the side um i think what hurt us though is it sort of concentrated it right along the edge of that strip so there again the nitrogen termination at the right time you know maybe we can terminate a little late, later as our as our systems get more uh biologically active but you know Use, use some caution early on, especially, or you might uh, ding your yields a little bit, but it's no, no reason not to do it. Just uh, get it done early enough. Yeah, and uh, we've got a, a comment and a question. Thank you guys for being so frank about the success and not successes of using your covers. Um, we really appreciate hearing that so that we can learn from it, like Ed said, we can get one person to not make that same mistake. You know, that's, that's wonderful. And then they're also wondering what kept you motivated to keep trying? You know, some people, they, they give up or are tempted to give up. What kept you guys going down, you know, to complete this for so many years? Can I go first? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, no, goes back to what, what's your goal, you know, have that, that thing that you you care about whether it's the the legacy of your farm your kids the I'm looking at the river right behind my screen <laughs> and that's a big one for me but uh day to day you know when you're grinding it out that's not always going to be enough so make sure you have uh people like like us on this call people uh hopefully nearby but uh you know once 
this has been really hard this year to actually get out and get that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, you know, find that any way you can though, because uh, that for me personally, that's where the, the energy comes from getting together with people who share your passions and you can cheer each other on and learn from each other. But, you know, being around those people makes you realize that you're not really crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> Well, I, I guess part of my motivation is I figure if Ed keeps doing it up there, I got to keep doing it down here because Blooming Goodview <laughs> has a huge rivalry. So I can't let him get ahead of me on any of this stuff. So I got to keep pushing along and keep making guys down here do it because they're making it work up there. So, or not making it work, however you want to look at it. So can't let Goodview get ahead of me. How about the other guys? What's your reasoning? Because you like you like speaking at at events, I'm sure that's it, right? <laughs> that's my favorite. <laughs> For me, there's part of it that no, agriculture, far. agriculture as a whole, and the industry frustrates me, and I want to find a different direction to go away from not having to rely on so many things that I have to write checks for. That's been a big motivator for me because I have zero control over that stuff, always needing new traits, always needing new herbicides, new traits so I can spray those new herbicides over my crop, things of that nature. So if there's something that can lead me off of that direction, and then there's a part of me um, that there's a lot of people who say stuff like this doesn't work, just makes me want to make it work. That's, that's a big part of it too. I don't, I, I like to, okay, let's see it. I'm going to show me that. Let's try it. I'm not going to take your word for it. So and then you stumble along and find a few things that you have success with and then go from there. I guess I'll, I'll kind of chime in. That the first time you rode a bike, did you have training wheels on it or did you not? Well, I didn't on mine. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, it wasn't even my bike. It's my older brother's bike. And I was bound and determined that I was going to prove that I could ride my bike, even his bike, even though he was a year and a half older than me. And the first time I rode it and I rode it right by him and I thought I was really smart and I got to try to turn around and I wiped out and skinned myself. And, but I got back on that bike and I rode it back in front of him again. And so then he threw a rock at me. So then I fell off it again. So you just, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're, we're agricultural producers. We're trying to, we're trying to feed the world and we're trying to do it in a more, um, natural or sustainable or regenerative, whatever, flavor word you want to use this week but uh you know bottom bottom line is is you know i guess i look back at it as you know our forefathers came here and homesteaded us and they worked a heck of a lot harder than we did and let's not screw it up for the, the next generation behind us Well, yes, I got started because having alfalfa in our rotation, you see the benefits three to four years after you rotate out of alfalfa. And I wanted to actually replicate that is when I first started looking at cover crops. And when I started back in 2007, I called the University of Minnesota, I called down the University of Ames, and they all told me it wouldn't work. Then I read about Gabe Brown up in North Dakota, and I thought, my God, if he can do it up there, I should be able to figure it out here. Then you start seeing those benefits, water infiltration, Bang the corn, we had our corn filled all the way out and the neighbors didn't. And we keep seeing all of these benefits as we're going and more and more as we go. So now it's gotten to the point, it's kind of fun, what can we try next? Well, and you know, let's, let's all look at it in the big picture. We've been blessed with beautiful soil and clean water. And we've done a lot of things to make that not work anymore. Like Matt said, we're, you know, we've been told we got to write all these checks to pay for this stuff. You got to pay for cover crop seed too. I mean, I wish I could give it to you. I really wish I could, but I can't because it costs money to raise and produce it and move it. But if we can keep our water cleaner, if we can keep our soil better, our crops more resilient, it costs us less money to produce it. The, the word that we miss in this sustainable, regenerative thing is profitability. 
it's all about profitability. And how are you profitable? If your water's clean, your soil's healthy, your crop's healthy, you will be profitable. And that's what we got to look at. And that's the one part I've been a little frustrated as we do all this regenerative talk and sustainable talk and all these words, nobody talks profitability because we've never done a real, really economic research on this thing. Everybody on the screen right now <laughs> that's been doing this, all these producers have economic data. They get what it's doing from, like Jerry said, water infiltration. We used to have areas in my uncle's field that would be three and a half acres and a heavy rain would drown out. Now, the last big rain events we've had, it hasn't drowned it out. So that three and a half acres that we put all the seed, chemical fertilizer, everything into, produced a crop. Now, it maybe wasn't 200 bushel corn, maybe it was 180, 170, 160, but we got something off something that used to be a zero. That's profitability. And that's where the soil health thing links in is profitability. I'm not buying ripper points. I'm not buying field cultivator sweeps. I'm not spending $100,000 in fuel. And I'm still raising a great crop. That's we got to tie together. So we are paying for things. I mean, like Matt said, you trade one. How would you and Andy say it? you trade one set of problems for another set of problems? You're right. Basically. But we learn how to manage them better and work with nature better. And when we treat her right, man, that lady's really sweet because she'll she'll pay <laughs> us back in in spades every time. I love it. You know, so my biggest motivation is you guys be profitable at the end of the day. I mean, my farm with my uncle at home, that's one thing. But as a salesman, I have to make sure you're profitable because if you're not there and profitable, my job's over. I got nobody to sell to. So I got nobody to work with. I want to see you guys be profitable in this. So when I said sometimes it doesn't always work, <laughs> it doesn't. <clears throat> at the end of the day, we want to make you guys profitable. And the way to do it is healthy soil, clean water, all the above I listed. That's my rant for the day. I'll, I'll quit now. One thing about that profitability that I don't think we talk about enough as commodity farmers is, you know, we can, we can do some of our own marketing. We can create some of our own markets. And that's something I'm dabbling around a little bit with. And that's the other side of the equation. Sure, we get our soil healthy and we can start to cut back, hopefully start to cut back on some of these traits, fertilizer, all these purchased inputs. But ask yourself, do you believe that you're crop is better? Are you doing better things for the, the environment? Are you doing more to keep the water cleaner than some of your neighbors are? And I'd argue, yeah. And, you know, what about the, the trait, the nutrition in that crop? Let's, let's look at getting some of that tested. Let's tell our stories and, you know, marketing is, is storytelling and it also has to do with the quality of what we're producing. So, look at those two things uh, and don't be ashamed to go out and do some of your own marketing, ask for more for that crop. If you can boost uh, people trying to start feed mills or any kind of smaller scale agriculture, local food systems. Uh, let's just, uh, let's not limit ourselves. Is the, the key point I'm trying to make here. Absolutely. Well, that's wonderful. Does anybody have any more questions out there, verbal or chat box wise? No? Oh, we're no, waiting. I'll just echo box. some of the things TJ said. But so there's no doubt cover crops are not easy. And we've all talked about we've had issues and things that haven't gone right. And it takes more management. There's no doubt it is harder. Um, but in my mind, what is every one of us doing here? We're all business owners. We're all entrepreneurs. We're all running a farm. Let's pay ourselves to manage, right? Maybe we can pull back on traits. Maybe we can pull back on herbicide. You can get a premium for non-GMO soybeans, a pretty good one. Can you do that if you, or you're not planting green? Probably not because we're pretty limited on herbicide. There's things management-wise that we can pay ourselves to do what we are supposedly doing, managing our farms, Um by doing that. So I think cover crops are just another way um, to do some of what we claim to do and be farmers and managers and, and business owners. I had a guy tell me one time, it's like a milking stool. Do you wanna be one of the legs or do you wanna be the butt that sits on top of the milking stool and runs all, sits on all the legs? Well, I'm kind of getting hefty, so I like sitting on the milking stool and letting everybody else do the work. So that's right. We start, I, I like what you say, man, you manage your crop, you manage your farm, not, 
if you just want to drive a tractor, that's fun, but you, it's the business side. You've got to really take notice to this. And that's what we start to do. Jerry, you saw it when you had the, when you had the alfalfa rotation going, you had a market for it. You worked on that. You made it work. And it, it showed you soil health practices that a lot of us had gotten away from years ago in our area because the alfalfa went away. So, I mean, that's, those are great points. You, you manage it. You manage your farms. Cover crops might not be easy, but I don't think it's easy watching all your, your dirt pile up in the ditches either. It's uh, tough to stomach. It's, I, I would rather feel good about what I'm doing, but do it in a way that is financially sustainable. Well, we've got another question. Jerry, you mentioned you're going to do rye as a crop. Are you going to sell it as seed or is it going to be grown for something else? No, actually, we're, uh, we're going to be growing some food grade oats this year and possibly uh, next year following uh, some uh, malting barley. Uh, I can't get our feet wet on this. I have grown wheat before, um, but I just want to get another rotation in there and uh, gives me some more opportunities with cover crops. In my area, we probably are one of the Swine capitals of the United States, I think, because I can look in any direction and I can see a confinement farm. And they all want to pull this top end off of their pits. And uh, one of the custom applicators said, if you got small grains, I'll strip that for you with RTK and you can plant right on the strip. And a lot of our hog producers in this area are doing that now. So have an ulterior motive. You know, that's cool to see, Jerry, that you're switching and adding to your to your crop system because I know when I was down there for those couple of years the issue was it was corn soybeans and that's all you could plant that's all there was that's all that could make sense um are you seeing it across your county as now people are starting to get a little bit more diversified maybe adding more uh maybe a different type of crop into the system and not getting away from the corn soybean corn on corn type not a lot I'm kind of a rarity uh because using alfalfa as a cash crop, of course. But uh, no, I'm not seeing the diversity I'd like to see. And part of it is, you know, Gabe Brown one time, we had kind of an argument and he said, well, you're stupid, just plant different crops. And I said, well, that's fine, but I gotta have a market for it. And he said, well, you got a truck. Yeah, I got a truck, I grow the wheat. The only place I get a market for it was up at Savage Road. For me, that's one semi load a day, unless I wanna get up at two in the morning and get two loads in there. So you kind of got to work with what you got to build. I do have a market for the food grade oats right away. So I'm not too worried. The malting barley can be a little tricky because it can get rejected, but I'm thinking I will gain some because of the manure that I'll gain off of that plus growing cover crops to add to the ground. Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you all to the farmers for sharing your information, your experience with us. It was very, very invaluable. We appreciate it so much. Um, and this concludes our winter soil health virtual series. So hopefully the next time we can all do things in person and see each other and talk, you know, at the tables and, and face to face. And so the winner of the last, uh, Talk Dirty to Me t-shirt goes to Shannon Rosinski. So Shannon, I'll get a hold of you, figure out uh, how to get that to you. Excellent. Thank you all again so much. And you know, if, if you weren't able to see the whole thing, they are recorded um, and they're put on our website. And thank you again uh, to all the farmers. Appreciate you taking the time and sharing all of your experience with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. Take care. Bye.